Brown and LeMay chapter one. Um, so what we'll be doing here, let me just bring up my marker. All right, so what we'll be doing here is going through the chapters one at a time. For chapter one, there's not a lot of material. Uh, you might want to look at the math overview or the math review before we start, before you start this chapter, just to kind of uh, refresh your memory as to some of the math concepts, some of the basic math concepts. Uh, so, uh, and I'll also in that review go through some things that you'll need to know as we go through the semester. All right, so uh, chapter one, just some very basic stuff. Uh, so first of all, welcome to chemistry. Uh, you've probably had this before in high school, but if you haven't, uh, this is your first time, then hopefully we'll be able to teach you how to do this. Uh, without too much confusion. A lot of people seem to get confused by chemistry and it's really not difficult at all. It's just uh, mainly a lot of using your common sense. So I'll try to point those things out as we go through the class. So in your class you're going to have a set of slides for each chapter. There will actually be two sets uh, and I'm not counting the math introduction in this. So for each chapter uh, you'll have one set of lecture notes and one set of work problems. So you should go through both of those for each chapter. Uh, and uh, then, of course, there'll be the videos, which will include uh, one video for each chapter for the lecture notes and one video for each set of work problems. So that's about 20 videos and 20 sets of slides. And then there's also the math introduction, the math review. So that's an extra. So there's 21 things total. Um, and for each of these, when I'm going through the lecture notes and the work problems on video, I don't go through every slide. I, I abridge them. So in order to go through every slide for each set, you would have to go to under your assignments tab in your Canvas course. You would have to go to um, assignments and then go down to uh, where it has uh, the lecture note PDFs or the lecture notes and then the work problem PDFs uh, and each chapter will have one set for lecture notes so you're going to have not only the video but you'll also have a PDF form of each chapter's lecture notes and work problems and they'll be more complete uh, than what I'm going to be doing on the videos. The videos I'm trying to keep relatively short so that it doesn't tie you up and doesn't tie up the video system and uh, all of that is long. I, I'd rather put them as a compact form where I'm just basically covering the absolute things that you need to know for each chapter and also for each set of work problems. And uh, so in order to get everything from the lecture notes of the work problems, you should go ahead and look at the PDFs. Okay, so what I'm going to do is whenever I get ready to flip the slide, and this is kind of like something that's coming from uh, precedent from things that we were doing in the spring when we started this and it's kind of formed a habit in my mind that is going to be kind of hard for me to break in. I don't guess it's really necessary to do this, but usually I'm going to say next slide just to let you know that I'm flipping uh, some of the formats that I used previously. You had to do that. Uh, most of these are going to be going and probably all of these are going to be going on YouTube. So on YouTube, you won't have to worry about it, but I'm going to go to the next slide. Okay, so just to give the credits here, which I'll do every time I make a video, um, they're uh, coming from primarily Brown and LeMay and Zumdahl's chemistry. Those are two separate textbooks. So Zumdahl was the ones that uh, produced the textbook that I'm going to use for a lot of this material, simply because it was already on their um, uh, slides that they sent out with the textbook and these are the ones that I used originally and then when we changed text we changed over to Brown and LeMay here and I just kind of kept the slides the same. So some of the slides are going to be from Brown and LeMay and a lot of them will still be from Zumdahl uh, and then in the work problems there may even be some from uh, McMurray and Fay, and also, uh, especially in the work problems, there will be a uh, Mr. Max AP chemistry website. So I want to just give credit to all those things. Uh, and then uh, a lot of the commentary, a lot of the stuff that's been added in, 
as my own material. So in some cases, uh, especially for some of the chapters, uh, there's actually more stuff that I put in than was originally present. In fact, that's probably true for most of the chapters. Let's go to the next slide. So again, this is as I was just saying. So I've enlarged upon these and I've edited, edited them extensively. Uh, and you'll notice that if you, if you want to see just how much I've edited these, then just get uh, one of the sets as they were put out by the publisher and compare them to the ones that you have in Canvas. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so for chapter one, uh, there are more than more things than this, but mainly we're going to be looking at uh, just an introduction to chemistry in general, and then also uncertainty and measurement and also sig figs. So those are the three of the big things we're going to be doing. We'll also talk about mass, volume, density, and temperature and the different temperature scales. Next slide. All right, so in chemistry, we're basically trying to relate what we see in our lives on an everyday basis with things that we can't see, things that are happening at the molecular level that we can't see. Like, for example, everything that we have around us, including our own bodies, is made up of atoms and molecules, which we can't see. So the goal of chemistry is to teach us how those things actually look at the microscopic level. Actually, it's not really microscopic, it's submicroscopic. Uh, things that you can't even see under a microscope. Uh, and then to relate those to what we we can see. Next slide. So matter is composed of tiny particles that are called atoms. If you break something down, like for example, if you had a wire that's made out of copper, and if you broke that copper down into its most tiny parts, or its most indivisible parts, I should say, then that would be an atom. It would be an atom of copper. Now, not everything that you see around you, like, for example, if you've got glass or if you've got uh, bronze or brass, like you've got a trumpet made out of brass, uh, those can't be broken down into atoms uh, because brass and bronze and glass are not made of atoms. They're not what we call compounds. So uh, uh, what, what they actually are are mixtures. So what we're going to do in this chapter is look at how atoms and molecules, which are combinations of different atoms, and then also how mixtures are made up and what the difference is between them. So for example, uh, brass is made up of copper and zinc, and so it isn't going to be able to uh, be broken down into just atoms of one particular element. It's actually gonna be able to be broken down into atoms of two elements copper and zinc. So it turns out that there are only about a hundred things that are actually present in our world. And as far as we know in our universe, although that's something that we really don't know yet. So um, everything basically in our entire world can be broken down into some combination of only 100 different elements. And those are things like iron, copper, zinc, carbon, hydrogen, helium. Uh, so those things are elements. They are pure elements and they're located or they can be uh, like uh, summarized in what we call a periodic chart. So the periodic chart is a chart of those roughly 100 elements. And uh, we refer to that chart a lot in chemistry. Uh, so, but there are some things like, uh, for example, water that you won't find in the periodic chart because water is a molecule so it's actually a compound so a compound is things that a, a compound is a thing that is made up of molecules an element is a thing that's made up of atoms so iron if you had an iron rod if it was pure iron would be an element uh, because it's made up of atoms it only it's made up of iron atoms water is not an, an element it's a compound a compound is something that's made up of at least two different elements and the elements in water would be hydrogen and oxygen so water is h2o so it's got some hydrogen in it the hydrogen is an atom and it's got oxygen in it and the oxygen is also an atom so when you mix the hydrogen atoms with the oxygen atoms you get water uh, so that would be called a compound 
Uh, a compound is a whole bunch of, uh, when you have a whole bunch of molecules. Okay, and an element is when you have a whole bunch of atoms. So just to come back to our slide here, the atom is, an anatom is the smallest part of an element that is still that element. And a molecule is when you have two or more atoms, like we said that water is made up of oxygen and hydrogen atoms, so a water molecule. So a molecule is when you have two or more different atoms. Uh, they don't have to be from different elements. So like, for example, H2 is a molecule. It's made up of two different atoms. H2 is made up of two hydrogen atoms. O2 is made up of two oxygen atoms. Okay, so let's go ahead and go on now to the next slide. So if you have two oxygen atoms and you put them together to make an oxygen molecule, then you would write that as O, but there are two of them, so you write it as O2. Uh, same thing for hydrogen. If you have two hydrogens and you put them together, you no longer have an atom. You now have a molecule because you have more than one atom. Uh, so, And you would write that chemically as an H, where the H is standing for hydrogen, and then you write it as H2 because the 2 is a subscript. Uh, that's showing that you have two hydrogens in your molecule of H2. So just to be clear, if you have one hydrogen atom, that's an atom. Uh, but if you have H2, that is a molecule. Next slide. All right, so when you have, uh, for example, if you have some oxygen and some hydrogen, those are atoms. Uh, if you put them together to make water, then you now have a molecule. So, for example, over here on the left-hand side, uh, we've got two hydrogen atoms that we've joined together with one oxygen atom. And when we join them all together, as we said before, we don't have atoms anymore. We now have a molecule. So, uh, this thing right here that I'm drawing a box around is a molecule. Uh, so it's made up of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. Put them all together, you don't have atoms in it, but well, you do have atoms, but we call the whole thing put together a molecule. Same thing over here on the right-hand side. Uh, when we have two oxygen atoms that are put together, we have an oxygen molecule. So I'm drawing a box around this oxygen molecule. So it turns out that if you take water, and I mean, this is something you can do industrially, uh, you can actually take water and pass a current through it, and that will produce gases. It'll produce oxygen gas, and it will also produce hydrogen gas. And it will actually produce, uh, for every two molecules over here that you start with of water, you can actually produce two molecules of H2 here, one, two, and then you can produce one molecule of O2. So when you do something like that, it doesn't have to be this, it can be anything where you actually have a chemical change, then that's called a chemical reaction. So one of the things you'll want to try to notice as we go through the class is not everything that we're going to talk about is a chemical reaction. Uh, for example, just one of many I could use, when you mix two things together, it's not a chemical reaction. So, for example, if you take, uh, let's just say you take some sand uh, and some dirt, and you may think those are the same thing, but they're actually not. Sand is like the stuff you find at the beach. And you, you'll remember when you've been at the beach, uh, you pick up the sand and it's different from the dirt you would find on a farm, right? Dirt is soil and uh, totally different from sand. Sand is actually silicon dioxide. Uh, in, you can actually melt sand and make it into something called glass. Uh, so sand has a different uh, constitution than like dirt. Dirt has all kinds of different things in it, that what we call soil. So if you take the sand from a beach and mix it with soil, that's not a, if you mix it up real good, then you can get a mixture, but it's not something that's resulting from a chemical reaction between the sand and the soil. Uh, Let's see, another example of this 
would be when you take water and boil it. So you'll want to try to remember these things that I'm saying because it'll help you as you go through the class. If you take a water and boil it, that's not a chemical reaction. It may seem like it is, but it isn't. You're just changing the water from being in the liquid phase to water that's being in the gas phase or steam. Uh, so, but that's just changing. It's just a physical change. It's not changing the way the structure of the water is. Here in this particular example where I'm drawing this little ring here, and then I'm showing an arrow going over here to the right hand side, uh, we're actually changing the chemical structure. We're going from something that looks like this to something that looks like this. Okay, so we're changing the chemical structure. So that is a chemical reaction. Okay, so just to, to review what I just said, if we boil water, that's a physical change, not a chemical change. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So a law is like when you see something that happens. Uh, for example, you notice that if you drop a book, it'll keep falling down to the earth. So that's a law of, it's called the law of gravity, uh, that says that whenever you drop something, it's going to fall to the lowest point accessible. Uh, that, that is something that necessarily hasn't been proven. It's just something that has never been shown to not work. In other words, no one has ever dropped a book and watched it go up in the air. So when you've got something that isn't necessarily provable, but you, you, you know it happens, it's called a law. Okay, a hypothesis is where you see something like that, or like you might see something like it on the atomic level, like for example in quantum mechanics, you might see something that happens, and then you might come up with a hypothesis. In other words, you might say, well, I think this is why it happens this way. So just to go back to our example of gravity, Newton might have said, well, I think gravity happens because there's a law that says that the uh, force due to gravity equals the mass times the acceleration due to gravity. And so Einstein might come along later and he may say, well, no, I don't think that's what it is. I don't think it's a field. I think it's because space has a certain shape to it that causes, for example, certain bodies like the sun and the earth to move according to the way that space is shaped or the way that space changes around uh, bodies like the Earth and the Sun. So those are both hypotheses, uh, and neither one of those has really ever been proven. Um, a, a theory, on the other hand, is when you have a hypothesis and you test it, and it gives a certain explanation. So a theory would be a set of tested hypotheses. Okay, let's go to the next slide. All right, in chemistry, we have a lot of measurements. Uh, and when you have a measurement, you will usually have a number and also a unit. So sometimes you'll have just a pure number. Like, for example, when you're taking logarithms uh, or logs, base 10 logs of something, you have to do that with a pure number. Uh, most of the time, however, we're going to be doing things that have units. Uh, so, for example, if you have uh, 30 degrees centigrade, you would want to write both of those. You want to write the 30. That's your number. You want to write the unit, too, though, because that way everybody knows what you're talking about. So uh, whenever you're writing something down, if it has a unit, uh, in, in other words, anything that isn't just a pure number, then you want to write the unit, too. Uh, otherwise, people won't know what, you're, what you mean. Um, and also, when you're doing these problems, even though uh, sometimes you may get in a hurry, you may not want to write the units all the way through the whole problem, but at some point, at the end of the problem, maybe, or I mean, even better if you, you can do it while you're doing the problem, I usually try to keep the units all the way through the whole problem. Uh, so I recommend you do that, too, just so you can keep track of what's going on. Uh, but anyway, at some point during the problem, you're going to want to write your units down. Uh, and if you keep track during the whole problem, during all the intermediate steps, it'll help you to keep track because some things, like for example, atmospheres are a, a unit or a way we measure pressure. But there are other me measurements of pressure besides just atmospheres. An atmosphere is the thing around the Earth, right? But it also, it's also a unit that we use to measure pressure. 
And it turns out that, and we'll find this out when we get to the chapter on ideal gases, it turns out that an atmosphere is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. Millimeters of mercury are also a measure <coughs> of pressure. So if you write down, uh, let's say 10, and you mean, I mean 10 millimeters of mercury, but you don't write it down, somebody might see that and they think, well, this is uh, 10 and it's, in, it's a measure of pressure. But does he mean 10 atmospheres or does he mean 10 or does she mean 10 millimeters of mercury? So it's important to write down what the unit is. So, for example, down here at the bottom down here, uh, we've got 20 grams where the grams is telling you the unit of mass. And then down here uh, at the very bottom, we've got 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34th joules times seconds. Joules is a measure of work or energy. Seconds is a measure of time. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. All right, so in this particular class, uh, instead of writing these things out, uh, you can do it if you want to on your exams, but you're going to discover, especially when you're doing this online, uh, that it's hard to write out times 10 to the 24th, and then you have to go back and you have to like highlight the 24, and then you have to choose superscript and all of that takes time, it's easier. And the way that I do it is just to write one E, and that's a capital E. So you, you, you don't want to really write that as a lowercase e. Sometimes people do that, but it's not the way I want you to do it. I want you to write it as a capital E, and then just write E, capital E 24. That's the same thing as one times 10 to the 24th. And the reason I want you to do that I mean, you don't have to, but I recommend you do it. It's just because it saves time. And especially when you're trying to type your answers in on Canvas, uh, when we're doing this online, or even when you're writing it out on a piece of paper, it's just a lot faster. So that's why Microsoft Excel uh, uses that. Now, Microsoft Excel is an extremely useful device that you probably have on your computer that you may not have ever used, some of you may have, uh, it's extremely useful in a lot of different uh, scenarios. So I recommend that you learn how to use Microsoft Excel. Now, it, typically I haven't in the past taught uh, a laboratory on uh, using Microsoft Excel, but um, in 11.11, uh, which is the laboratory portion of this class, uh, I mean, I just taught that in the spring of 2020, and I didn't give them a computer and chemistry lab, I don't think, but I typically do that in 1412. So 1412 has both lecture and lab in one class, and so one of the laboratories we do in there is uh, computers in chemistry, where I teach you how to use Excel. So if you don't know how to use it, then I recommend that you go ahead and start trying to learn how to use Excel in your spare time. But anyway, if you do learn how to use Excel, you'll see that this is the nomenclature, uh, not the nomenclature, but this is the abbreviation system that they use so that they don't have to write out this times 10 to the sixth or whatever. They just write 2.3 E6. And so I just kind of like uh, decided that's a pretty good way to do it. And so I started doing it that way myself. All right, anyway, that's enough said about this. So let's go on to our next slide. So uh, when they're talking about SI units, that stands for Systeme Internationale, where uh, it was actually started in Europe, in, specifically in France. And they just wanted to change everything over to the metric system. The United States has done that as far as in science in, in universities, uh, but in a lot of the United States, they still don't use SI units. Uh, there, uh, I think there's a, been a push from the scientific community to get uh, the US to change over to SI units. So, uh, but it hasn't really ever caught on here. So what I mean by that is, for example, in the United States here, the scientific community and universities and also, I, I think possibly uh, hospitals to some extent have switched over so that they would use, for example, meters for length, right? 
but a typical Joe citizen in the United States doesn't use meters. He may kind of like have an idea. Oh, a meter, that's about uh, a little bit longer than a yard, or it's about 39 inches. But basically, in the United States, most people still use feet and inches. So for this class, uh, if you're used to that, as I was, you'll have to get used to using these SI units. And every time I say this, I'm not going to say Sistine Internationale. I'm just, everybody just calls it SI, but that's what it stands for. And so when we're in the United States, it's going to be confusing to you if you're from like South America or another country or from Europe and you're from a country or Asia where you're used to using the SI units. So uh, you, you'll be familiar with the units that we're going to talk about right now but you won't be familiar with things like pounds uh, in the United States. They use pounds instead of kilogram. Pounds actually is not a mass unit. It's actually a weight unit. Uh, so in uh, the SI unit, when we say kilograms, we're talking about a mass unit. Uh, anyway, so uh, you'll have to get used to it in the United States because they don't use like, for example, uh, temperature they don't use centigrade they use Fahrenheit or I should say we use it because I'm an American uh, so you'll have to get used to that uh, and you'll have to kind of like learn how to kind of like mentally convert these things so like uh, but anyway let's just run through these I'm actually talking more than I should be probably to keep this brief but this first chapter is not that long anyway uh, but we do need to go ahead and get going so let me just go through these and I'll try to stop talking so much so in the SI system, which is based in France or Europe, uh, the base unit for mass is the kilogram. The kilo here is a prefix that stands for 1000. It's abbreviated with a lowercase k. So that k that I'm underlining right there is an abbreviation for kilo, and kilo means 1000. We'll, we'll get to that in just a minute. So when we say a kilogram, we're saying 1,000 grams. So the reason they don't just use grams for their basic unit is because it's too small. So they're trying to use something that's useful. So it turns out that a kilogram is more useful to use as the basic unit for mass. So a kilogram is the basic unit for mass. A meter is the basic unit for length. And so in... American units, if you're used to American units, uh, it would be about 39 inches or a little bit more than a yard. Uh, the unit for time is seconds. The unit for temperature is kelvins. A kelvin degree is the same size of a degree as a centigrade or a Celsius degree. But the scale is different because centigrade basically is if you took the centigrade temperature and added 273 to that, then that would give you the Kelvin temperature. And we'll talk more about that later in this chapter. Uh, the unit for uh, electric current is an amp or an ampere, which you really probably won't use that until you get to 1412, if you take 1412. Uh, the unit for amount of substance is the mole. That's true in the United States also. The unit for pressure here, it says it's a Pascal, uh, and that is the official unit, but usually we won't use that. Uh, so when we get to the uh, chapter, uh, chapter 10 on uh, ideal gases, we won't use Pascals that much. We'll use atmospheres or tors or millimeters of mercury. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so just briefly, I'll let you look these over on your own and pause the video if you want. Uh, but the ones that we're going to use mostly in this chapter and in this course would be kilo here, and I'll put a red mark by it. Uh, that means a thousand. Mega means a million. Giga means a billion. And that's probably about all you'll need to know for this class. You can look the other ones over, but we won't use them that much. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. And then for the ones that are less than one, uh, one tenth would be uh, deci. Like a decimeter would be one tenth of a meter. We don't use that one that much. The ones that we will use the most will be centimeters uh, or centi whatever. Centimeters, the one we'll use 
uh, most in terms of the units that we would use along with the length. Uh, and then also, it's also the one that we'll use the most in terms of the prefix. So the ones that I'm underlining here, centa, like a centimeter is one one hundredth of a meter. Uh, one millimeter would be one one thousandth of a meter. And a micrometer would be one one millionth of a meter. Okay, so the three that I have underlined there are the ones that you should learn. Uh, also, we'll be using nanometers just a little bit in this class. So that's one one billionth of a meter. So why don't you go ahead and learn that one too? Because we may be seeing that a little bit. And then this next one here, a pico meter you won't see that in this class probably but if you ever wanted to do like ham radio and get licensed that's one of the things you would need to remember so a picometer is one uh what would it be i guess it's one quadrillionth i'm not actually sure about that it's 10 to the minus 12th meters uh so that's something that you but you probably won't see that in this class so you really don't need to remember that next slide Okay, uh, mass and weight are not the same thing. Mass is the measure of an inertial state of an object. It's its measure of its inertia. Weight is actually when you multiply its the body's mass times the acceleration that's due to gravity. So in the metric system or in the SI system, to get the weight, you have to multiply the mass in kilograms times the gravitational constant, which is 9.8 uh, meters per second squared, which you would already know that if you've taken physics. Uh, so in the American system, we say pounds when we are talking about how much something weighs, but that's actually the weight. It's not the same thing as the mass. So in the American system, you would have to multiply the mass times the gravitational constant, which is different. The gravitational constant is not the same in the American system. Uh, and uh, I can't remember. Actually, I think it's 32. Uh, it's, and then it's per second squared uh, for the American system. So it's different, and we don't really use it in this class. So you don't need to know it anyway. So in the metric system, the mass is going to be measured in, let me just mark it here, the mass here is going to be in kilograms. And the gravitational constant, uh, and you probably won't need to know this for this class, but you would for a physics class, is 9.8 meters per second squared. Next slide. All right, I put this in just a few minutes ago. Uh, it wasn't in this set of slides before, but I wanted to put it in here so that you can see that there are three different equivalent ways of saying one thing. Uh, so when we're talking about a volume, we're talking about something. Let me just try to draw it down here. So it would have a height and it would have a width and it would also have a length. So like, let's just try to make this like this and play like this is a box. It's really hard for me to draw with this little marker. But OK, so and then I'll try to put it up like that and then down here and then down here and then across and then across so play like that's a little box there so we've got the length here and then we've got the width here and the height which they're about the same here so the volume of this box would be the length times the width times the height for example uh, if this box were 10 uh, let's say centimeters long and one centimeter wide and one centimeter high, then its volume would be 10 times one times one, which would be 10 uh, centimeters to the third power because it's centimeters times centimeters times centimeters. I just want to point out in this slide that it's the same thing to say, for example, 1000 cubic centimeters here, which is abbreviated as a CC, 
that cc stands for cubic centimeters. That's the same thing as to say a centimeter to the third power because they mean the same thing. So if you say 1000 centimeters to the third power, it's the same thing as if you said 1000 cc's. Now, technically in this class, we'll be uh, mostly saying, I mean, if we want to be proper, uh, we would say 1000 centimeters to the third power which means 1,000 cubic centimeters. But I may say 1,000 cc's uh, because it's just faster. And also, if you ever go into med school or nursing school or anything like that, uh, once you get to nursing school or medical school, they won't say uh, 1,000 centimeters raised to the third power. They'll say 1,000 cc's because it's just faster. So uh, medical people say cc's, just to get it done. Uh, also, milliliters are a measure of volume, whereas centimeters are a measure of length. But if you take a measure of length and you have a length and a width that's measured in a measure of length, and then a height that's measured in a measure of length, uh, when you multiply them all together, you get a volume. So you could either say, well, it's a measure of length raised to the third power, like we've got over here, so that would be a measure of length that I'm underlying right there on the left. That's a measure of length raised to the third power, but it's also a measure of volume, right? Because this thing that, that we have here that we just measured length, width, and, and height, it's also a volume. And so a, a milliliter is also a measure of volume. One milliliter is one one thousandth of a liter. One liter is like if you take a two liter bottle of pop and cut it in half. I mean, not exactly because part of the two liter bottle of pop is gonna be the part at the top that has this, like the, the um, cap and then there's a space that's just air. So a two liter bottle of pop's not really two liters, but the, the liquid part of it is two liters, supposedly. So if you cut that liquid part in half, you'd have yourself one liter. If you divided that one liter into 1,000 equal parts, you'd have one milliliter. So if you take 1,000 milliliters, you've got one liter. So they're the same. But you could also say that if you took 1,000 cubic centimeters, you'd have one liter. Or if you took 1,000 centimeters to the third, you'd have one liter. OK. so. What I'm trying to say here is that one centimeter to the third is the same thing as saying one cc. And that's the same thing as saying one milliliter. So you'll want to remember that as you go through the class. You'll want to try to remember that right now and like indelibly uh, print it on your brain so that you won't have to keep coming back to this slide and to this set of lecture notes all semester long. So just try to remember one centimeter to the third is the same thing as one cc. And that's the same thing as one milliliter. And if you have a thousand of any of those, you've got one liter. Okay, now you can also take it in the other direction. What if we had a thousand liters? Well, if you had a thousand liters, you'd have, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so here's a picture of the centimeters to the third so each one of these little tiny boxes here is one cubic centimeter, or one milliliter. If you have a thousand of those, you've got one liter. If you take a thousand liters, next slide, so now you've got one cubic meter. So that's another thing you'll want to try to remember. One cubic meter is 1,000 liters. Don't just try to remember it for the rest of this class. Try to remember it for the rest of your career or the rest of your life because it's something you're going to be using again and again. So here we don't have little boxes made up of centimeters to the third. These little boxes are each one liter. And if we have a thousand of them, then we have one cubic meter. Let's go to the next slide. All right. Uh, uncertainty and significant figures. Next slide. <clears throat> All right, so when we measure something, uh, we have some degree of uncertainty. Uh, and usually what we'll do is when we're measuring something, we'll write down everything we know for sure. 
like let's just take the example and I'm gonna have to kind of speed up here but let's say we've got this little uh, I didn't do a very good job let me try it again let me try to be a little bit more careful this time it's really really hard to draw things with this a little marker thing that they give me here that thing on the bottom here this one down here uh, is supposed to be a straight line which it isn't quite but play like it is so let's say we put a ruler next to it okay and so use your imagination and uh, let me add a little bit more length to this okay so let's say that's a ruler the thing on the bottom is a ruler and let's say that this is zero and this is let's just pretend that this is one and this is two and I'll try to draw those but it's really hard to do it. and it also kind of wastes time so there's two and there's one there's one and here's zero All right, so how long is our little line up here? This one. Well, it's between one and two. Can you see that? It's between this mark here and this mark here. So we would write it down as it's one. Uh, and then I guess we put a decimal point here. Uh, but it isn't one or two. It's between one and two. And just looking at it, uh, what would you say would be the next part? So whenever you've got something that you're measuring and your measuring scale isn't accurate enough to get every little detail of the length, then what you can do is you can guess one digit. So if you're looking at this right here, um, we're right there. As far as the length of our line above there, which it looks like it's about it's less than halfway across right but uh it's kind of hard to guess but let's just say i mean i would say that's about 1.4 it's about four tenths of the way across to two so the the in other words if you divide up the distance between one and two let's just say it's about 0.4 okay in other words it's about four tenths of the way between the one and the two. So that's called uncertainty. So you're allowed to guess the last digit. So we guessed four here. So that four is an uncertain digit, but we're allowed that because that's the way the system works. They allow you to guess the last digit that you can't see for sure. Now we know for sure it's one and we know it's less than two. So it's gotta be one point something. So what we're doing is we're guessing what the next number would be. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, look over here at the right, over here. Because uh, so here are some of the things you would use in a laboratory, which if you're taking this in the summer 2020, you're not going to uh, be using these because you're going to be doing this online. Uh, you'll be doing your lab online unless you take it at some other semester uh, later after we get done with this uh, online stuff unless unless you're taking it online after that but so anyway these are some things you would have used this is a flask this is a pipette this is a graduated cylinder um, and this thing over here as we said before is a burette uh, so for all of these things um, they're going to have some inaccuracy so when you have inaccuracy you use the system we just talked about next slide all right, so now let's talk about the difference between precision and accuracy. So they're not the same thing. People probably use them interchangeably, but they shouldn't. And certainly in this class, you won't want to. So when you have something that's precise, that doesn't mean it's accurate. And if it's accurate, it doesn't mean it's precise. So what's the difference? Well, accurate means it's where it's supposed to be. So like, for example, if you've got yourself a scale and you take a test weight that you know is supposed to weigh, let's say 10 grams, then if you put it on your scale and it says 10 grams, then your scale's accurate. But that's different from precision. And it's really uh, actually easier to see this with the picture we're going to see in a minute. But precision doesn't mean it's accurate. So, for example, if you've got a scale and you take a one, uh, uh, sorry, a 10 gram test weight or mass, put it on your scale and it says uh, eight grams then it's not not accurate it's off right 
uh, it's supposed to say 10 grams and it's not saying 10 grams, it's saying 8 grams. So, but if every time you weigh that test mass, it says the same thing. It says 8 grams, 8 grams, 8 grams, 8 grams. Every time you weigh it, then it's precise. Every time it's giving you the same value. Uh, but it's not accurate because it's off. Its accuracy is off. So let's go to the next slide. And I'm going to try to speed up a little bit because I've already gone through um, kind of a long time here. And somehow this timer on this thing has turned around backwards. And I'm not sure why it did that. But anyway, uh, that's weird. Anyway. Uh, so, but, um, so I have no idea how long we've been going, but, uh, <laughs> that's weird. So the timer was giving me my total time and now all of a sudden it's working backwards. So I'm assuming that I've gone up to 35 minutes. Now I'm going the other direction. So I guess I'm at 45 minutes. So that's too much. So, and we have a long ways to go. So let's go ahead and keep going and get through this. So uh, look over here on the right hand side. Here's an example of something that's precise because everything is just about in the same spot. But look at that. Is it accurate? If we're trying to throw the darts at this bullseye here, then it's not accurate. But it's precise because everything is right in the same spot, but it's not accurate. Over here on the left, it's not either one of them. It's not precise because the things are not all in one group. And it's also not accurate because uh, they're not on the bullseye. But now look over here on the far right. Here, everything is on the bullseye, so it's accurate. And also, they're all kind of together in one group, so it's also precise. So that's what we mean by precision and accuracy. Next slide. So in significant figures, uh, there are going to be a few rules that we're going to have to learn. Uh, so what we're doing this for is to find out which figures in a figure that we read that we measure are going to be counted as significant. So this is kind of like related to what we were talking about before when we talked about things that were um, uh, uncertain, figures that were uncertain. And I'm just going to watch this for just a minute to see what's happening with it. Okay. Uh, I was just looking at the timer. Okay, so we have some rules to do sig figs. So we're going to call this sig figs. Uh, so what are sig figs? Well, sig figs are like, for example, if you have a number in your calculator where it's like it says your answer is like 12.36742 uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and it may give you like 10 digits in your answer. Well, it's kind of cumbersome to try to write down all of those digits. And besides that, it's also not really accurate. I mean, you're actually not supposed to keep all those digits. So we have to have rules to decide how many of those, like if you had 10 decimal places, how many of them can we just get rid of? Okay, so that's what sig figs are all about. Now, it turns out to be useful to some extent. It also turns out to be kind of a pain in the neck to some extent. And in some cases, it just gets to be downright uh, annoying uh, because sometimes it actually kind of gets in its own way. So uh, what you're going to discover in biology and chemistry and physics is that the textbooks always start off in the first chapter by telling you this is how to do it. But you'll probably notice that in a lot of the books, by the time you get over towards the middle and towards the end of the book, it's like they just kind of forget about it. Uh, and I'm not saying they do, but it just seems like they just don't worry about it as much. Some textbooks do and some textbooks don't. And then another problem with it is that different textbooks use different systems uh, to do the different problems. Like, for example, and we'll talk about this more. I mean, I, I can see this is going to turn out to be kind of a, a long lecture. and I didn't mean for it to be. Uh, but... Um, Different textbooks, like for example, Brown and LeMay does things a little differently from other textbooks. So the rule that we're going to use in our class is the rule that most other textbooks use. And also like the rules that are used at the University of Houston and Texas A&M that I know that because I've been in 
uh, school in those universities. I've been in grad school in those universities. And I know that the rule that they use is different from the rule that's used in your textbook. So we're going to use that rule instead. That won't be the only time probably that we'll use a different rule from Brown and LeMay, but that'll be probably the one main time that we'll differ from Brown and LeMay. So the way that Brown and LeMay does this is a little different. So I'll point that out as we go. Uh, and then the other thing I want to say about this is that as far as I'm concerned, when you're doing a problem, I just want you to concentrate on the problem. And I don't want you to be too worked up about whether you get the sig figs right. So um, most teachers are going to be maybe different from me. So keep that in mind if you take another teacher for a different class in chemistry. So most teachers want you to not only get the right answer, but they also want you to write the answer in the right number of sig figs. And that's perfectly OK. But my concern is more that you figure out how to do the chemistry and, and that you get the answer. And I want it to be the right answer. But when you write your answer down, I probably won't ever mark off if you don't have the sig figs right. There's only one exception to that, and that's if the problem is a sig fig problem. So in other words, if you're doing one of my exams, and it would only be for the first exam, uh, or if you're doing the final exam, there's usually one problem on the final exam that asks you to do this to the correct number of significant figures. So on that particular problem, yeah, you want to make sure that you do it the way that we're getting ready to say. Uh, for the rest of them, you want to do the sig figs, uh, but if you don't write it down exactly to the exact right number of sig figs, I'm not going to count off for it. Okay, so let's, having said that, let's go through this. So for significant figures, uh, it turns out that anything that is not a zero is always considered to be significant. So we're kind of like singling out zeros, which hopefully you'll see why in just a minute. <clears throat> because zeros are sometimes put into numbers when they don't really have any significance. So the first rule here for sig figs is that if you have a number like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up through 9, it's always going to be significant. Uh, let's go to the next slide. For zeros, it's more complicated. So there, it turns out there are three classes of zeros, leading, trailing, and captive zeros. So let's look at these uh, in turn. Leading zeros are zeros that, as it would indicate from the name, come before the number. So here, where I'm underlining right here, this 0 0.048, the 4 and the 8 will be significant, so you leave them in. Um, the zeros may or may not be significant. In this case, these zeros are referred to as leading zeros because they come before the number, so they lead the number. Usually, um, for example, this 0 0.048 is perfectly okay. I mean, it's okay for you to write your answers in this form and just leave them that way. Uh, if you wrote that, however, I mean, if you decided you want to write it in scientific notation, then you would have 4.8 e minus 2, where the zeros, if you'll notice, then they're gone. So evidently, the zeros don't have any significance as far as actually determining what is the value of this number. So the rule here is that leading zeros are not significant. And it doesn't make any difference whether they're on the right-hand side of the decimal place or the left-hand side, as we see here. Either way, they're not significant. OK, let's move to the next category. Captive zeros means that there's a zero between two non-zero numbers. So for example here, we have 16.07. And this zero has to be significant because it's in between two other sig figs, two other numbers that are significant. So because of that, it is significant. The zero is significant. Next slide. Uh, the ones that are a little more confusing are trailing zeros. So trailing zeros, as the name indicates, are uh, zeros that come after <coughs> the uh, rest of the number. 
So here it depends to some extent on <clears throat> whether <clears throat> these things are on the left of the decimal or on the right of the decimal. Uh, all right, so if they're on the left-hand side of the decimal, we don't really know. So here I'm underlining 150 here. <clears throat> For 150, we don't know if that zero is significant or not. So you just have to either guess or you have to have a little rule that you go by. Uh, and for your exams, my rule that I recommend for you is that you consider it to be that it is not significant. Uh, so, uh, because there's no way for you to know if it is or not. Here, uh, above here, where I'm underlining now, this 9.300 has two zeros that are trailing zeros, and they are significant because they're on the right-hand side of the decimal place. In other words, what's happened here is that someone has put these two zeros right here in intentionally to show you that they've measured this value all the way over to three decimal places. So the 9.300, uh, for those two O's, they will be significant. So be sure that you look this over until you understand it. It's not particularly difficult, but you just have to get used to it. All right, so what if we have something like this 150 here and somebody writes a decimal point after it, like I'm circling down here at the bottom. So in that point is not like a regular period at the end of a sentence, but it's in a, a place where it wouldn't ordinarily have a point there. Then that means that that zero is significant. So if it's like this over here on the left hand side, this one that I'm underlining right now, you don't know if that zero is significant or not. Uh, it could or could not be. So on a test, I recommend you say it is not. But if somebody writes a decimal point after that last zero, they're doing that specifically to show you that the zero at the end there is significant. Okay, uh, so let's go ahead and move to the next slide. Uh, and here I'm just kind of like reminding you of what I just said. So. If you want to pause here and look at that some more, you can. Otherwise, let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> uh, okay. Um, and then when you have an exact number, like, for example, if you count seven pencils, then those seven pencils, that seven is considered to be significant, but it's also considered to be infinite. So in other words, it would be considered to be an infinite number of significant figures. Uh, and that's also true of some other things, like when you say there's 100 centimeters in a meter, both the 100 and the 1 meter are considered to be an infinite number of significant figures. Also, when we do our conversions later for temperature, uh, like when we're converting from temperature to uh, from Fahrenheit to centigrade uh, degrees, we're going to use like nine fifths and five ninths, and those are also considered to be infinite numbers of significant figures. Now, what that means has to do with what we're getting ready to look at next, and that's when you multiply or divide or add or subtract. Uh, there are rules governing that also that are different, and those rules are going to ask you to limit your number of sig figs to the lowest number of sig figs, basically, in the numbers that you're dealing with. But so what we're saying here, and we're kind of doing this out of place, but what we mean is that if you have a number like the nine fifths or the plus 32 degrees or whatever, then you would not consider those as a basis for limiting your number of sig figs. So you'll understand that better when we get to the next portion. Um, <clears throat> So, um, for example, they're down at the bottom here. They say if you have nine pencils, then you consider that to be an infinite number of sig figs. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this slide I'm going to let you look at on your own uh, because I think we've already talked about everything in here. <clears throat> so if you want, you can pause this. Otherwise, I'm going to go to the next slide. All right, so we said that there were some rules that we hadn't looked at yet, uh, and here they are. So there are two rules more that we need to look at real quickly. 
One has to do with when you add or subtract, and it tells you how many sig figs to keep out of your sum or your difference. And then another rule looks at adding, and, I'm sorry, multiplying and dividing. <clears throat> and then there's another rule that tells you how to know how many sig figs to keep. So first of all, let's look at multiplying or dividing. So if you look at our example here, we've got 1.342 and it's multiplied by 5.5. .5. So what you do is if you're multiplying or dividing, you want the lowest number of sig figs. So here, look at the left-hand number. We have 1.342. That has four sig figs. And then 5.5 .5 has two. So we're gonna keep two in our answer because two is the lowest number of sig figs out of these two numbers right here. So when we get our answer, we actually get in our calculator 7.381, but we only want to keep two sig figs. So we're going to have to round this number to this one. So that means that we have to round eight. <clears throat> Either we have to leave it at eight or we have to round it up. And the rule is if this number here at the end is five or more, you round up and it's not. So we leave it as eight. And then the same thing here, this number is more than five or five or more. So we round that three there to four. So the answer becomes 7.4. Again, we keep two sig figs because this number right here only has two. So this is the rule that you would use in multiplying or dividing. Next slide. For adding or subtracting, it's different. So be careful here. So here we have five sig figs on the top and three on the bottom. So according to our previous rule, we would choose three, but it doesn't work that way because we're adding here. So when you add, the rule is that you keep the number so that you wind up with the same number of decimal places that you would have had from the one that has the fewest decimal places, which would be this one. This one only has two decimal places. The one on top has three, so you can only keep two in your answer. So when you add these, you get five plus zero is five, and then four plus three is seven, four plus eight is 12, uh, and so forth, and you get 31.275. But you can't keep the five because it would violate your rule for sig figs. So <clears throat> you have to round that five off, and you would round that one up on the next number over. So the 3.27 becomes 3.28. All right, so that's it for the rules. Let's go to the next slide. All right, so we have water. Here's an example, uh, two graduated cylinders. One is 2.85 and one is 0 0.280. Okay, so this one here has two decimal places, right? This one has three. So how many of the decimal places will you keep in your answer if you add? So this is asking here that we add these together so how many sig figs would you keep? I'm sorry, how many decimal places in this case would you keep? And the answer is you would keep only two. So whatever you get in the last column over here, you get rid of it. Now in this case, it's a zero anyway, right? So it wouldn't matter, but it won't always be that way. Next slide. Okay, so here's our answer. And you'll notice that there are only two decimal places. Next slide. Uh, and then the next slide, uh, next, next. <clears throat> All right, now moving on to another topic here, dimensional analysis. Um, gosh, I may have to actually stop this thing because the timer has messed up somehow. So what I may actually have to do is stop this and do a part two. <clears throat> Uh, so anyway, let's talk about dimensional analysis real quick, and then I'm going to stop. And the reason I'm going to stop is because I'm afraid that this thing has messed up and that what it's going to do is it's going to shut me out uh, in about five minutes, and then I'll just be wasting my breath. So uh, let's just talk very quickly about this. So let's move to the next slide. So dimensional analysis is just a kind of a fancy way of saying how you would convert to certain units. For example, if you want to convert inches 
two feet. So if you're not from the US, there are 12 inches and a foot. So for example, if I told you that I had something that's five feet long, and I asked you to tell me how many inches that would be, you just multiply five times 12. <clears throat> so when they say dimensional analysis, it sounds harder than it is. Uh, so the way that you would actually do that would be to use what's called a conversion factor. And the conversion factor would be 12 inches is one foot. So you can either write that as uh, one foot over 12 inches, which is shown on the left here, or 12 inches over one foot. It doesn't matter. And the reason is because 12 inches and one foot are the same thing. So when you divide either one foot by 12 inches or 12 inches by one foot, it's just one. So when you multiply anything by one, it's still the thing you started with. Uh, but you want to do it so that you cancel out the thing that you're trying to cancel out. In other words, if you're trying to convert feet to inches, you've already got it in feet. So you want to put the feet on the bottom of your conversion factor. So what you would want to do is multiply 6.8 feet times 12 inches in one foot. So you would want to use the one on the right here for that kind of a problem. And then your feet here and your feet here are going to cancel each other. And you're going to be left with an answer in inches. Next slide. So when we do that, uh, we're going to wind up with what we have here. The feet are going to cancel. I'm down here at the bottom. Uh, we're supposed to convert 6.8 feet to inches. Uh, and so we just have to take our calculator or whatever and multiply 6.8 times 12. Next slide. Uh, next slide. And when you multiply the 6.8 times 12, you should get 82. Okay, so here is our answer. What about sig figs? Well, we multiplied both of the uh, quantities we multiplied had two sig figs and the answer has two sig figs two sig figs, so we're good. Next slide. Uh, here's another one that I'm going to let you guys do on your own for the sake of time. Uh, an iron sample has a mass of 4.5 pounds. It's actually 4.50. And we have our conversion factor here, and I wrote it both ways. So you can either have it as one kilogram is 2.2 pounds, roughly, or, well, okay, no, this is separate. So uh, what we're supposed to do is, first of all, convert it from pounds to kilograms because that's the way the conversion factor is that we have. Now you could actually write it differently uh, and make it where you could do it all in one step, but anyway. And then once you get it to kilograms, since they want the answer in grams, you have to do a second conversion where you convert it from kilograms to grams. Okay, so we're starting with pounds. So we want to write our conversion factor here where we have the pounds on the bottom. So we want to write, we want to write one kilogram on the top draw a line in the right 2.2046 pounds on the bottom as we have here and then to go from kilograms to grams we want the kilograms now to be on the bottom of that conversion factor so that these kilograms will cancel with these and we'll be left here with pounds canceling here and here and the answer is going to be in grams okay so this is not difficult so the bottom line is that you're going to get your answer in grams. And then just go ahead and what you'll do is you'll divide 4.5 by 2.2046. You can just do 2.2 and then multiply whatever you get when you do that. That's going to be about 2. And then multiply it by 1,000. You're going to get about 2,000. So it actually turns out to be 2,040. Okay, I'm uh, afraid that what's going to happen here is that I'm going to get blocked so I'm going to go ahead and stop, and uh, I'll have to do a part two for this, unfortunately. So let's go ahead and stop this, and I'll see you in part two.